G'day, my name is Benjamin Carlo. I'm a software engineer, I'm a systems engineer, and today we're going to be talking about systems engineering. Today the subject is functional analysis. This is a pretty important subject in systems engineering and in value engineering and in a number of related disciplines, safety engineering, RAMS analysis. So functional analysis is actually a pretty common thing. It's a common way of exchanging information between a number of different engineering disciplines. And it's a way of coordinating the overall design and governance of your system. So I thought I would start with the basic concepts of what a function is. Now, a function is something which accepts some input and it produces some output and it does something in the middle. So we're looking at something, some transformation of input data or input materials into output data or output materials. So what we're looking to do is describe all of the things that the system does. We're going to describe the system in terms of fairly simple, really tangible concepts and they're usually described in terms of a verb and a noun. Do something with something. That's the, the basic structure of a function, to have take some input, do something to it to produce some output in a very easily legible and understandable form. One thing that we often see is not knowing what the scope of a function should be because you can define a function at still a number of different levels within a system and it can be difficult to get the appreciation of how much you should break down a function. There's a, a great misnomer that's been going around the software engineering community for many decades that a functional analysis is where you get the functions of the system and you decompose them and decompose them and decompose them and then you start to design the software. It's not actually quite like that. In a systems engineering worldview, you would say that a function is always tied to a component. And where you have one component at a particular level of the design, there's never a need to break up a function of that component into two functions on that component, unless you're talking about support functions and the like. But the, the high level, the basic functions of the component, you don't actually need to break them down beyond that top level to start with. So what I've shown you here in this first view is just the two basic views that we have in the systems engineering world. And they have different names depending on the particular tradition or discipline that we've been talking about. But usually they're called something like a logical view or a functional view and then a physical view or a schematic kind of view. And they serve different purposes, but they are closely interrelated how you design the system around these concepts. What I've done is I've drawn a little dotted line between the two views so you can see that there's kind of a mirroring relationship between the two. So what we have is a function which has a flow to another function and the first function is actually reflected onto this first component and the second function is actually part of this second component. We know that there's a flow of something between the function of component one and the function of component two so we also know there's actually an interface between it. There's this mirroring of what the system is and what the system does. So your, your two components have an interface between them, the functions have a flow between them, function one maps to component one, function two maps to component two, and the flow between them maps to the interface between those two components. When you have that sort of description in place, it's a very simple kind of description. It's not down to all the, the detail of a requirements spec. It's much more amenable to modeling and to designing the system in a flexible way without having to dig too deeply into specific requirements or the description of a function of an interface. So once we have this sort of setup, what we're going to think about is, well, what is the design of this component? What is the design of the, the other component? And what is the interface between them? And there'll always be this knitting together of the functions, the what the component will do, and the design of the, of the component that meets those functions or meets the requirements of a given interface. So rather than dwell on the abstract, I thought I would start to dig into a bit of concrete example. And I thought we would talk about a microwave. Now, this is a very simple example of how functions and components can mix together and, and work across this mirror. So what we've got in here is the control panel of the microwave and the magnetron. So this is a highly simplified version of the microwave, and we'll go into a slightly more complicated but still very simple example of a microwave oven later on. 
what I've said is that physically there's a control panel where I'm going to press buttons and I'm going to program the, the microwave oven to to cook my food and there's a magnetron and I'm assuming there's nothing else at this stage so the control panel has an interface to the magnetron we're going to have to design the control panel we're going to have to design the magnetron and we're going to have to also design the interface between the two so that those two teams that are going to be working on those different two different components can actually work together and away we go but at a systems engineering level it's actually not so much our job to design any of those three things. We're not really trying to design the control panel. We're not trying to design the magnetron. We're trying to design a microwave. We're not trying to design the control interface. So the main thing here at this level is actually identifying what components we have, identifying what interfaces we have, and identifying the functions associated with each component and the flows associated with each interface. So when you have those, we have is a systems level kind of description of the system which might end up being detailed as a functional spec, a requirement spec for the control panel, a requirement spec for the magnetron, and an interface requirement spec for the interface between the two, which will then further be elaborated and as part of the final design. But it ends up usually being the responsibility of the two teams, the control panel team and the magnetron team, to actually dig into the detail of what that interface needs to be, because we're not at the level where we know all the details that would affect the design and we're not we don't have the actual expertise at this level necessarily to make all the design decisions associated with that interface so we might have a number of different disciplines we might have some a discipline that's very electromechanical another discipline that's very computer intensive and service orientated than like and we may have some of those skills, but there's no guarantee that we will have all those skills within the systems team. What we're actually trying to do is just to identify those interfaces so that they can be designed between the two groups. And we'll do some governance around that. We'll, we'll ensure that, that whatever they do design meets the requirements that we've identified. And we also will probably do something like identify one of those parties, the magnetron team or the control panel team. We'll identify them as the lead and the other one as the match contractor or, or a, a team so that uh, they can work together in a way that is reasonably consistent. And of course, if they've got any irre irreconcilable problems between the two teams, then they can still come back to us and we will, who's boss and which approach will be taken if there's any kind of dispute that is, is too difficult to resolve between the two teams. If we move back up again, we see this reflected mirroring between the physical and the logical or the, um, the functional. And so for the control panel, we're just trying to select a program. For the magnetron, we're trying to irradiate some food to make it hotter. And the two things that we've identified as going across the control interface is that the control panel is going to select the power level and it's also going to select the duration of the irradiation burst. So that's what's going to determine how much heating is actually going to occur in the food that we have in this microwave oven. So that's the basic concept of functions and the basic concept of how those functions relate to components of a system or just systems in general or subsystems. The functions find what the components will do. They're the active part of the description of the system. The components define what things we're going to build, what things we're going to design. And we're going to further break them down probably as we go down through these levels. But what we might actually do before we do that is jump back up one level. So we're going to look at the whole microwave and how that fits into its environment so that we can get a sense of how these components and how these functions actually stack up at multiple levels within the architecture. Here is your microwave oven. We're at the top level. What we're going to do is we're going to look at the system of inter interest being the microwave. So down here in the physical view, we can see that the microwave oven is the system of interest, there, but it has a context around it. And excuse a few stray lines here. I was editing this in Inkscape and it's not quite perfect. But the microwave oven is going to serve the user and it's going to interact with food to heat it up. It's got a cabinet that surrounds it and it, it's going to draw electricity from a power circuit that is within its context. In this environment, all we've identified for this is just one function for the microwave oven. More complicated systems tend to have a lot more functions. For example, a control system might 
have responsibility for control and monitoring of a number of different types of plant or to uh, do particular kind of reports or different kinds of activities. And so a system is very likely to have more than one function. And those functions are typically fairly independent, but we'll get to some concepts of support functions soon enough. But the functions are generally independent and they're following this verb noun pattern again. So we're going to heat food. That's a straightforward thing. We can all understand what it's trying to do. We're not confused by the individual requirements and the complexities that might be involved in that. We haven't necessarily defined how it's going to heat the food. We have at this stage said we're designing a microwave oven and it's important often to have a, a system concept to work with. But we could even have taken a step back here and just said, well, it's a food heating device and we haven't actually decided whether it's going to be microwave or conductivity or uh, inductive heating capability. But in this case, we are approaching this as a microwave oven so we can simplify and be clearer about some of those aspects. So the user is actually quite involved in the microwave concept. What they're going to do is they're going to load the food when it's needing to be heated. They're going to select the program to run for to, in terms of heating the food and they're going to remove the food at the end. The food itself is going to receive heat. So on this side you see there are three functions that are allocated to the user, the load food, the select program and the remove food functions. And the food itself has a receive heat function which I mean you could phrase it in a few different ways but certainly it's required to increase heat when it's irradiated by the microwave oven. And the power circuit is just going to supply us with power. And the cabinet, there are a few things we could talk about supporting the microwave, but we're just going to focus on the requirement to remove waste heat in this environment. So we're assuming that the cabinet is well ventilated enough to remove a certain number of watts worth of waste heat that we know is going to be generated by this kind of device. So that's the, the sort of functions that we've got. Now, that also identifies for us a number of interfaces. So we've got a user interface, and that user interface has to be capable of loading food, unloading food. So that's mostly the oven door and the, uh, the arrangement within that heating chamber. We also have a select program function, and so they're actually going to be inputting the program we're going to use to heat that the food for them. And that program, we're going to need to design that user interface as part of the system. So we're going to have to design that really the, the two main parts of the user interface, which is selecting the program and loading and unloading the food. And those are both user interfaces we'll have to deal with and they need to be designed. But we don't need to design them here. We just need to identify that they exist so that they do get designed as the uh, engineering process continues. There is an interface with the food. We need to understand how the food is going to react to our microwave energy in order to translate the user's selected program into the correct interaction with the food. So we're going to need to know things like, well, how much weight are we talking about? What the volume is of the food is? Can we fit the food within the microwave in order to heat it? There's all sorts of characteristics of the food we'll need to know, and that defines the interface that we have with the food. And there may, in fact, be multiple different types of food that we have to treat differently. And we know that the average microwave oven has a whole bunch of program settings on, on it that deal with different kinds of food. So just from that industry experience, we can tell that we're going to have to deal with a number of different kinds of food and we're going to have to uh, characterise the food that we're going to be able to heat fairly well and define that interface fairly well. Um, the power circuit, we're just going to be drawing AC power in a standard format. There may be different formats around the world, so we need to know what that interface is. We need to know what voltage and what frequency we're going to take of AC power. We're going to need to know whether there's a range of frequencies and a range of voltages we have to tolerate. Do we have to deal with hazardous power situations? We get hit by a lightning strike, are there hazards and the like? So I'm not going to go into the hazards in this analysis at all. There's a lot of hazards that you can get into with a microwave oven. You don't want to irradiate the user. You don't want to blow up the kitchen. You don't want to catch fire. So there's a number of hazards that we have to deal with in, in this case, but that's really the subject for another video. Cabinet is just taking waste heat. So what you can see is a top-level function for the microwave, which is to heat the food, and the microwave oven is the system of interest. It's the component that we're going to now design and we're going to take all these interfaces into account and we're going to take the function to heat the food into account. So 
We're still taking a fairly simple view here, but what we've got is some basic, let's say, Wikipedia-based system design going on here. And what we have is basically a transformer that's going to accept power from the power circuit. It's going to power the control panel, and it's going to power a magnetron to generate the microwaves. So you can see down at the physical view, we've got a transformer. In fact, it's often the case that components will be named after their functions. If there's a very specific function that a component has, you'll see that transformer is actually, that's the name of the function, is to transform power. So you'll often see that in, in a design, as particularly as designs become more mature, you'll see that a component will just be what its function is and we'll understand what that means you know, without having to have further description of it. But the transformer is going to produce power, and it's actually probably just going to produce power for a couple of voltages. So it's not one transformer, it's really a, a transformer assembly, and we could even just call it a power supply at this stage. But it's going to transform the power to generate the microwaves and also to load the program within the control panel. The control panel is going to provide the program to the magnetron so that it can generate the microwaves that are needed. There's a waveguide, and that is going to conduct the microwaves to the food chamber, and the food chamber's job is to contain the food. It's also, I mean, we don't have a lot of space and on these diagrams in the video, but of course it's also to maintain a standing wave, and there's all sorts of tuning that's needed to be considered in this whole scenario, but we're just going to brush that aside a bit, and we're going to look at the basics just from a components and functional level. One thing that I don't have any interfaces or arrows to is the case and its function to conduct heat. Now, all of these functions above are actually uh, waste heat generating functions. There's going to be some waste heat that comes out. There's also a need for containment and the like. So really, all of the components are going to have some interface with the case that is going to affect its need to vent heat into the cabinet and also to support the, the unit. So the case is, a, is really kind of a support component and the conduct heat function is a support function. So find that often appearing within the systems that are complicated. You'll have a few functions which are there that are just common. They're going to affect a lot of the other sort of basic functions. That would be considered, in terms of value analysis, they'd be considered a support function. So that's the basics, and I'll sort of jump back up again and down again. Here's the top level, where the human's loading food, selecting the program, removing the food once it's heated, and the microwave's going to heat the food using power, and it's going to vent waste heat into the cabinet. And down at this next level, we've got the same sort of thing going on. We've got functions which are directly attributable to specific components. And there's no need to break down functions any further than the components you have. The physical design and the logical design are always in lockstep. They're always closely related. And every function is allocated to a particular component. And every component, there's no need for a function to be broken down further once it's been allocated to a component. The components themselves will then be designed and there may be further breakdown when that design occurs. But once you've identified a component at a particular level of the design, there's no need to break down the functions further than you have components. You don't want to have more functions than you have components unless there's a really good need for it, such as that they're distinct functions that don't have any relationship to each other. So one thing this does is it generates an overall structure and there are actually two concurrent structures that occur within the system. One is the physical structure and one is the logical structure as the physical structure is when the system is broken down onto its subsystems or a, an assembly is broken down to an, onto its components and we can see how that system is built up from its parts and that'll play a big role in how we build the thing and how we price it and how we assess whether the, the costs of manufacture and the like are appropriate. But the functional side also has a breakdown. So at the top level, we had this heat uh, food function, but that's actually broken down onto the functions of the individual components. And that gives us two trees, and I'll switch to that view now. So what we've ended up with is a logical tree and a physical tree. And these can grow quite large on big systems. What they do is every part that any person is building it really puts it into this overall structure of where they exist within the overall 
governance framework for the system and also what their part is for and what it has to achieve. So what we're trying to do is really link from top to bottom of the system. We're trying to link the objectives of the system to the actual implementation, the building of the system, so that we don't overbuild the system, we don't gold plate it, we know what it's for, we don't need to achieve more than the system needs it to achieve, but we also don't miss any functionality. So we're trying to make sure that functions of the system make their way all the way down to the, the subcomponents. And there's a couple of interesting features of the diagrams here. Now, we've only got sort of a two-layer thing, but we could have, on a big system, we might have 10, 10 layers, 16 layers on a really big system. Most systems that are sort of maybe, mo most systems are, are less than that. I've annotated this with how and why. So we're looking at the logical view here, and we're asking the question, well, how do we heat food? And the answer to that is in these functions. Well, we heat the food by, by containing the food, by loading the program to irradiate the food. We transform power to generate microwaves. We conduct those microwaves to the food and we conduct the waste heat out. So that is how we heat the food. So that's a, a very clear, basic, high-level description of how the whole, whole system works. So you can see for any part of the system how we're trying to achieve that particular function. And you can quickly assess whether those steps are necessary, whether some are missing, and so you can assess missing functionality, missing components out of that. We can also say why. So why are we conducting waste heat away? Because we're heating the food. Why are we generating microwaves? Because we're wanting to, gener to heat the food. So we all always know, we always have some reference frame in which to decide, well, how good does this thing need to be? Specification we're trying to build it to. So what level of performance and what level of endurance and those sort of things. So we can always connect what we're doing at the lowest levels up to what we want from the system. A uh, feature to try and reduce the gold plating, but also not to miss any functionality. Now we also have a corresponding physical structure and here I've included the system context which includes the user, the food, the system of interest which is our microwave, the cabinet and the power circuit and I've included the system of interest then breaks down onto the food chamber, the waveguide, the case, the control panel, the magnetron and the transformer components and then they may break down further. If we've gotten down to a level where a particular team can take it over and work from there within a single engineering discipline, then you've pretty much finished the systems engineering phase of the development. That's really the point at which you're trying to take things. So if you get to a point where something is pure software, then you let the software engineers deal with it. If you get to a point which is pure engine design, then you know we, you let teams that have that expertise and who know how to do those particular types of drawings that are useful for explaining the system and designing the system, you, you leave it to them. There's all sorts of additional discussions we could have about line replaceable parts, about uh, configuration items and where we break things down to for configuration items, but I think that they will end up being in a different video. So the only other thing I can tell you that's possibly interesting is about these interfaces. And remember how we had some external interfaces of the overall system. We had the user interface, the food interface, the power circuit interface, and the cabinet interface. So those are all interfaces of the system. Now one thing that we can see on this, this microwave oven uh, simple diagram is that the parts all have some linkage to those other interfaces. And in fact, what we end up having is an interface that is broken down onto the smaller components. And in some cases, a single interface can become more than one interface, and you can get a more complicated kind of outcome from that. But that's the desired outcome in the end, that we want to break down components, we want to break down interfaces to the level where somebody who has the expertise to design that component and somebody who has that expertise to design that interface are the people who are ultimately then responsible for doing that design. So the user interface, for example, we found is actually broken down in this. There's between the user microwave interface has broken down onto a user to control panel interface and a separate user to food chamber interface. So those are interesting elements of how you look at a system. 
that from a systems engineering perspective, you really want to break those interfaces down as little as possible at the top level. But as you break down onto components that different people are implementing, then you're trying to take it to a level which is compatible with the actual system design. And that may result in interfaces that are broken down and broken up into smaller interfaces that are more applicable to the design and to get the right people involved with designing their particular part of the interface. So I think that's all for me today. Just a quick recap. So we've got functions which take input, they produce output, they are typically named with a verb and then a noun like heat or food and that keeps it nice and simple. A function is always attached to a specific physical component. A flow of information or materials from one function to another is always connected to a specific interface. So the physical and the logical interfaces are always closely tied together and there's no need to break things down in the logical view any more than you've broken them down in the physical view. When you do that, you get this hierarchy of functions and they describe how you achieve the high-level functions and why you're doing the low-level functions. That also gives you a template for breaking down your requirements. And we also get a system breakdown structure which gives us a lot of understanding about how the system is going to physically hang together, how it's going to be built, what we need to design and what we need to do to build the whole thing. So that's it. Systems engineering. It's not rocket science, except when it is. Thank you for listening.